Welcome to the Leafy Podcast, helping real estate investors and entrepreneurs grow. Say hello to your hosts, Jennifer Glagoric and Brian Price, founders of Leafy Legal Services, teaching you how to protect your assets, grow your business, and manage your wealth. Let's start the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Leafy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am the podcast manager, Tammy Gearling, and today I have our hosts, CEO and COO of Leafy Legal Services, Brian Price and Jennifer Gligorich, and they have a wonderful guest that they're going to be introducing right now, so I'll go ahead and hand it on over. Well, we have a really great attorney here. He's from Texas. He's a local Galvestonian, and we talked to him before. He's an expert on offshore offshore trusts and international trade law, and we'd love to welcome, again, Rocky Rydell from Rydell Law Firm. Hey, Rocky, how are you doing? Hello, doing fine, doing fine. Trying to so, stay cool, right? <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> That's it. So today, okay, so we went over offshore trust before, and that is like a huge sub that we could talk about yes, forever. Yeah. So this kind of rolls into stuff. that in about offshore overseas trust and insurance. Yes. And I remember we were at like a coffee shop talking about it, and I said, well, what about this? Can you borrow against it? Can you do it? And I was like, we've just got to have you on the show because it's yeah, so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about private placement life insurance and as opposed to variable life insurance and what people can expect if they want to do this on an overseas way. Sure, sure. So, um, let me pull my notes here. Sorry. So I will, I just want to preface this and start off with explaining that, that why would somebody uh, need like overseas insurance, right? Now, overseas insurance, uh, the insurance industry in the United States is very, very regulated. Overseas insurance has that benefit where it can offer um, greater coverage sometimes or, or more unique coverage than what the U.S. Re- US regulations allow for. So that, that would be um, primarily why certain people would consider it. Other reasons that maybe you would think about it is if you are living overseas and you need something, um, you know, to deal with overseas or, or beneficiaries that you want to cover overseas, maybe your children. So uh, these are these do get very – uh, custom, very customized, and very um, complex, I will say. And it's something that really takes a, a, quite a bit of time in understanding what what your reasoning is behind wanting it and, mm-hmm. you know, what the benefits are going to be for you. So I, I will say that generally um, it's not for everybody, but sometimes it, it's, it fits the right purpose that you need it for. So... Um, yeah, let me, oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, because there's lots of, there are tax consequences to that. So it's not just like offshore trust. It's not just like we're running away and we're going to go over here yes. and we're going to live here and nobody's going to ever touch us again. There's all these things you have to think about. You have to get a good lawyer, good CPA and all that other stuff like that. Um, exactly. So yeah. who, give us a scenario of why I would need a, uh, an offshore, like an offshore life insurance policy. So, um, offshore life insurance policies, you're probably going to have more flexibility in how you can draw against it. So in the U S there's, there's particular laws and and regulations about how much you can pull out, what you can use it for, um, how much, you know, how much, how much, uh, of the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the premium that you can you can have access to and this and that. Whereas overseas, certain jurisdictions, it's kind of the wild west. Um, a lot of that is going to be much more flexible depending on what your needs are and what your, your interests are. Um, so that is, that's the primary reason that we see folks interested in offshore uh, life insurance, that they have more flexibility with it. Um, well, that's and it also, pretty big. I yeah, mean, it is a big one. Yeah, that's a big one because seriously, you get talked into by insurance agents. Not to, not to, <laughs> not to kick on all of our insurance yeah. agents because we have them on the show. We love our insurance <laughs> agents, but some of them do talk you into this. Oh, you'll be able to get money out of this if anything yeah, happens yeah. with your health or your kids. But it's and all then in come, a box, right? Yeah, yeah. and then oh, okay, <laughs> and then you go to do it, and then oh no, not for that, and not for this, and you yes. have to be wearing green on Tuesday in order to be yeah. able to get, and you can only get this much percentage, and you're like, that's not what I thought I've been paying for every exactly. single month. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, this is pretty big. 
And I will say another aspect of that too, why folks would be interested is that, um, you know, people who are trying to diversify away from the United States for whatever reason, whether you're, you know, you, you think that maybe there's a recession coming or, or folks who live uh, like on an island, like you and I, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes insurance companies close, they have to, they have to fold because there are such great um, claims against it, whether it's a natural yeah. disaster or economic recession or, or both, you know, that would be a mm-hmm. one, two hit for folks here in Texas, if, you know, hurricane and then oil went south again or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's an, it's another aspect of being able to get away from a U uh, S centric investment portfolio or a, a U.S. centric asset protection plan where you can have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more security in knowing, well, if the U.S. drags, drags its feet and has a recession, then, you know, my life insurance policy and wherever um, li- likely won't be hit as hard or, or, you know, won't be touched at all. Mm-hmm. So those are the two primary uh, considerations that we yeah. see. What are the is, biggest Is there only um, certain – is it only life insurance you usually see overseas or are there different insurances as well you can get um, overseas? Good question. So there are, there's different types of insurance available overseas. Primarily mm-hmm. the, what most folks, most folks are going to be looking for is going to be the life insurance um, because typically that will have the availability to, to draw against it and this and that, you know, depending on the, the jurisdiction, yeah. depending on the, the exact setup. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are options to insure just about anything, anywhere, um, and depending on what it is you need and, and what you're looking for, you know, uh, you know, you could go to Lloyd's of London to insure, you know, whatever, anything, <laughs> anything exotic <laughs> for the right price. Right. Um, versus, you know, if you just want, you know, boat insurance and you think you can get a better premium, say, in uh, you know the Caribbean or, or Canada or something, you right. know, that that may make sense. So. Okay. Um, Are there certain countries that you that you suggest or or actually don't suggest people go to when it comes um, to these types of things? Okay, good. It's a very good question. I I won't say that there are certain ones that I would necessarily uh, recommend. Okay. Um, just because these things get so customized that mm-hmm. depending on where you have your interest in, mm-hmm. um, and what types of, of insurance vehicles that you think that you want, it really, really can vary. Um, but okay. typically, you know, a lot of folks will look at stuff like in the Caribbean um, mm-hmm. and in Latin America, be- just because of their, how close they are to the U.S., okay. um, some familiarity with dealing with U.S. customers, like in Panama, mm-hmm. a lot of the companies there uh, typically will work with Americans, so that it's not, right. it's not something scary, it's not something beyond their capabilities, they don't mind that. Um, you know, I, I would, you're a, well, okay. Well, so a general area that I would say probably, probably wouldn't be a best fit for folks would be Europe. Europe okay. has very regulated insurance, just like the U S that can mm-hmm. differ from, from nation to nation there, but that's in general, uh, probably Europe wouldn't be the first place you go for an offshore insurance. Okay. And there are, there are some pretty exotic stuff that I've, that I've, I don't know if I should say seen that I've, I've read about, <laughs> uh, I've never used any of them or had a client that had a fit for it, but there is pretty exotic stuff like in the far East, like Singapore and mm-hmm. Hong Kong and stuff, because those are financial hubs and they, they do, they, they are looking for a way to kind of pull business away from Lloyd's of London's and whatnot so that they have some, some interesting, um, interesting packages. Okay. And whatnot that they can do. Yeah, so some of the benefits I was reading over um, and listening to you are that sometimes there's lower fees than you as yes. insurance. So you can yeah. have actually a higher payout and a lower fee than you're paying than the life insurance yes. potentially yep. here. Yep. And that the better tax results on the payout. So yes. the, that because yeah. generally the return basis payouts are not taxable, but proceeds are taxable. Yes. Can you and explain be, that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So so um, in general, let's go, we'll start with the disadvantage, I guess. So yep. disadvantage is generally of international life insurance. Um, your tax liability will be a bit different than here in the U.S. Uh, generally, so the uh, – the, oh, let me look at my notes here. Um, okay, yeah, so dividends, interest, capital gains, and bonus, generally those are going to be taxable as passive income, and that would be – uh, part of what's considered the, um, give me one second. I'm sorry. 
I'm losing my place in my outline. Do, 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 do. I'm going to do <laughs> yeah. the music while he does Yeah, it. yeah that would be considered <laughs> like part of the premiums where the surrender and the value cash out. So that would mm -hmm. be the premiums that you've paid in. Mm -hmm. um, those are going to be usually not taxable because that's a return basis. So that's what you've already mm -hmm. paid. You already paid taxes on it when you, you know, paid into it or whenever mm -hmm. you owned it as your own, um, your own cash. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's depending on how you structure that insurance policy and what exactly they consider your premium and what exactly they're going to consider the, uh, the cash out value, you may or may not have some tax liabilities for certain ways that, it, that you're being distributed that cash. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the other aspect of that too, of the tax uh, considerations is that there is a, uh, an excise tax. So 1% on your p premiums that you pay uh, that you don't have to pay if it's in the U.S. And that's, that's basically a protectionism thing. We, for whatever reason, the insurance lobby uh, felt like they needed a 1% <laughs> tax to protect <laughs> themselves against foreign insurance companies. Uh, but those would be the disadvantages and, and that rolls into the tax filings. The tax mm -hmm. filings for these can get complex, um, sometimes even more complex than an international trust because of how customized they can be. And there really will be, you really will need some work on um, figuring out what exact, how, how exactly your, your international insurance plan or policy is gonna be considered in the US, how it should be taxed and what type of filings you're, that you're going to need. Mm -hmm. And that can vary pretty widely. So. It's, there are some significant downsides to it, um, but sometimes it still may make sense for, for folks to, to consider an international insurance. Okay. Hmm. Now, I guess before we jump too far, I will yeah. say, tie this back to, to trust. Maybe folks are wondering why we're talking about insurance. Um, but a lot of times it will make sense for an international trust to have an insurance policy owned by the trust that mm -hmm. will... Uh, be basically on maybe the grantor or some U.S. person's life, uh, and then the beneficiary is going to receive the benefits of that. So that can help reduce taxation if you couple an insurance policy, a life insurance policy, coupled with an, an international trust, mm -hmm. and you're starting to add real complex uh, cogs into this into this machine. So okay. your, your compliance costs are going to be a, a bit increased because you're going to have that accounting and CPA considerations and also uh, mm -hmm. on the legal end, you're going to need to make sure that this stuff is, is structured correctly so that you minimize tax obligations for the beneficiary whenever they, they receive um, the, pre, the payouts or value or what, whatnot. Along those lines with the taxation stuff, um, we know obviously you want to pay your taxes and everybody should pay their taxes. The yeah, IRS yeah, will always find things, so never <laughs> never try to cheat them. But when it comes to the country it's in, is there also filings with this country as well for for some taxes, depending upon where it's at? Is that um, something? Yeah, yeah. So no. yes and no. Some some countries do care that uh, about mm -hmm. what type of insurance policy you have. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the smaller ones, um, from what I have seen, what I recall, do not. It's not okay. a taxable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not a ta taxable financial instrument. And okay. and that's the nice thing about why these. these who have uh, who become known as a trust jurisdiction <clears throat> excuse me is a big part of that is that they they position themselves to be both a low tax jurisdiction and a jurisdiction that respects privacy and protection of assets that's why they mm -hmm. become known as, as a um as an international trust jurisdiction that'd be like cook islands marshall islands antigua mm -hmm. uh saint kitts and nevis um trying to think in some instances the bahamas of course in the Cayman okay. Islands, but you know, depending on what what your goals are and what jurisdiction may be a match for you, it can vary. But um, yeah, and by and large, those countries have no tax obligations to foreigners for anything that that you know, bank accounts or certain financial instruments. So a lot of times, you won't have any financial obligation to those local. Yeah, and I can see why they're so like if you've ever been to like the Cayman Islands and how exquisite it is. It's like mm -hmm. unbelievable how how um, not only Americanized it is, but like you, you walk right off. I've been there for a cruise and you get off the cruise ship and it's like everything 
you know, you're like in the middle of a downtown, really nice part of yeah. Hollywood or something, you know, <laughs> Rodeo Drive, you know, they have every, everything, you know, you have Fendi and, 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 you know, Gucci and yeah, all the yeah. stores and all the stuff. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And they, the way that they, they essentially will, um, I know we're getting kind of off track, but I will say that they, they typically will tax their locals, their local citizens or their local businesses and they'll tax financial transactions as opposed to taxing foreigners who put their assets there. So th mm -hmm. they encourage you to put your assets there and then potentially depending on what your trustee will do with those assets, whether they'll, um, you know, how they manage them or how they invest them. There may be some, <clears throat> excuse me, some financial uh, taxes, uh, okay. to what they're doing, but yeah. that's the way that they're going to, that they make money and benefit. So their interest is to bring as much money as they can to their jur jurisdiction and maintain low taxes so uh -huh. that they can uh, gather as much business as they can, as much wealth, and then tax it at, a, at just the, what they need as opposed to uh, splurging on it, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's really interesting. So uh, I think that it would be interesting for, for insurance purposes, especially if you are worried about, like, the way insurance is going. I mean, even just Social Security, you know, you've, we are going to have to start looking at other at other areas, I think. Yeah, so options. I think that, the, yeah, I think it's important when people are looking forward to go, okay, this is definitely, now it's on the table. And the good thing is because we're so globalized, if America can get ev everywhere, you know, and you're worried about just staying in America, well, now America can get everywhere. Yeah, so maybe yeah. you shouldn't worry <laughs> as much anymore. And it's just a different thing that maybe we'll have a better, you know, a better payout for you or, or better benefits for your yeah. For your the people in your trust and, and your the beneficiaries that you want to give the money to. Yep. And yeah. some of the other benefits as well is um, it includes coupling it with a trust. You're going to get some of the benefits of that trust as well. So being able to tr to um, to distribute some of that uh, the payouts or whatever the cash value of that um, of that insurance policy to another generation without having to go through a probate process or without having to go through a costly, um, you know, tax obligation is one of the other top benefits of that. So there's lots of reasons why to consider it um, in potential benefits, but what the benefits are that might be for you or for one of your listeners could vary greatly um, depending on what it is and how they structure it. But it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's something that it's another option available to you that you can help ensure wealth transitions to the next generation or a way to, um, to protect, you know, your children or, or whomever your spouse, but also have some flexibility in being able to, to, to claw some of that money back if you need to, um, you know, borrow against it or whatever, uh, with a little bit greater, uh, what was a lot greater, I guess, a lot greater flexibility than the U S would allow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because it's it's your money, but then they tell you, no, you yeah. can't get it back for this. So <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, I had asked you one question. I said, so would it be possible to get an overseas trust? So let's say, you know, I've always been like, oh, I love Belize, right? So, yeah, so yeah. okay, I get a place in Belize, right, right on the beach where I can snorkel all day long, but it's not, I don't control it. It's held by a trust and the mm -hmm. beneficiary mm -hmm. is my children, Mm -hmm. or is, is the beneficiary but yet in the trust i have it to where i will get to live in that residence until for the rest of my days I, I said can you do something like that and you said i'll have to look into it did you ever look into that yeah so depending on what you're if you're trying to minimize your tax obligations mm -hmm. um you know that may not be the best option um because it, you're going to be you're still going to be benefiting from those assets. Uh, but from a legal perspective, uh, generally you can do that. You can still benefit from the property while it's still maintained by a trust. Uh, you're just adding that extra layer between you and the ownership. So right. even though you're benefiting from it, you're living in it, you don't own it. And ultimately you will have some obligations as a, a resident or a tenant or, or whatever, right. however you term it. You'll have some obligations of course, to still maintain the property for right. on behalf of the trustee and on behalf of the beneficiaries. So you're going to have some, some additional obligations. Um, potential tax situation may not look as pretty because you're still benefiting from it as then if you, if it was in a trust by itself and you had no 
um, benefit from it. But in general, yes, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. And that's going to, that's going to vary whether that's, that's the best thing to do. That's going to vary depending on the situation and what you have and where you're doing it. Sometimes like if you're it's trying to easier. avoid something, what if you're like, well, like what if you were going to go bankrupt and, and before you did that? So you would have to like really, but you wanted a place to live and you're yeah. like, well, if I did it that way, I could live over there. And if I did it this way, I'd be living in a trailer. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that would work, uh, but sometimes it's easier too, depending on the jurisdiction. And I don't, mm. I'd have to do some research on Belize, but mm. uh, sometimes it's easier just to put it into a foreign LLC. Right, yeah, have a right. foreign LLC, and, th and that could add enough layers where creditors would still have a very difficult time reaching into that LLC and taking the assets. Right. This and isn't happening to me, by the way. I was just, I just was trying to think of different situations. Now, <laughs> no, really. one thing I would like to mention for your audience too is, mm -hmm. is that if you are getting into a point where you have potential creditors coming after you that are what's what's termed foreseeable. Mm -hmm. um, it's already too late for you to put a lot of this into into international asset protection vehicles, whether it's a trust or um, an LLC or something, because a from a U.S. perspective, because a U.S. court will say, well, you you knew that you were going to owe these people, you knew that it was going sour, and you decided to move stuff offshore anyways. You're going to be held responsible for that. That's going to be considered um, hiding your assets and, and mm. trying to to run away from your obligations. And that counts even for the IRS, of course, yeah. right? Um, but even for, for creditors here in the US. Is there like a time frame if you moved it over that it, it could be outside of that? Um, uh, there's no rule? hard and fast rule, okay. unfortunately. It, it's, <laughs> the, it's, it's the courts, and the re there's a reason for that. It's like, right, you, you don't wanna have a, a, time, a timeline because then we'll, people will cheat the timeline. Um, right, right. They'll you know, sign documents and this and that that will make mm -hmm. it very, uh, complicated and oh, mm -hmm. so so our timeline we you know the timelines pass and now you, you can sue us or whatever um but it's going to be based on the uh the uh uh where did it just escapes me one second it's uh what was I gonna say? it's going to be based on the uh foreseeable that's right. it's going to be based on foreseeable mm -hmm. so however whatever you can whatever you obligations you owe and whatever you can tell maybe obligations in the near future that you're going to owe and that you're going to be responsible for courts are going to be are going to deem that foreseeable and that can vary give and take depending on what it is and, and what's happening but if you you sign a contract in a personal guarantee typically that personal guarantee is going to be foreseeable for the term right. of the personal guarantee mm -hmm. so hmm. That's interesting. Okay. We yeah. know, well, we, um, we were following a case that had happened um, with, some, with some marketers and that those marketers had private islands and things like that. <laughs> and so we've been following it to see like how long the process takes to go through these layers because oh, they did this, but they did a lot time. of it in the foreseeable. So yeah. even though they knew what they were doing and why they were doing it, it still takes a pretty long time to go yeah. through it. So that's why I'm asking, because there's a lot of people that were, were hurt by them and uh, are waiting for payouts. You know, they're yep. waiting yep. They're back this money and then you can file and then the government says, okay, well, we get, you get 10% back of whatever yeah. your damages were. And it's just taking years. It takes Yeah, years. it will take a long time. Um, and in particular, you know, depending on where, where those assets are held in, the, in the, the court system you have to go through in the local jurisdiction, it could take a, a long time. Yeah, because some um, of the countries are like, we don't care, America. Yeah. They don't all, they don't, there aren't all like, all, yeah. okay, let's work together. <laughs> yeah. Some are like, nah. Yeah, no, they'll yeah. make the U.S. go through the court process just like anybody else. And that could yeah. take a long time. Yeah. And, you know, they may not put consideration on fraud, right? Whether there's right. a fraudulent transfer, which is what that would be considered mm -hmm. um, trying to, to, to move it when you shouldn't be moving it be a fraudulent transfer when it's foreseeable. Um, and yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, some of them don't have such strong fraud protection. That, but it doesn't mean that the person gets that, the access to their money. So they don't have access either. Yeah, that no, country, it's usually locked that down. Yeah, 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 that country's got the money. They're doing yes. it. They're, all those politicians are partying somewhere else, <laughs> and they're just deciding not to give it to the American politicians. So it's yeah. not like you're getting away with anything. You're yeah. still broke. Yes, it's, it's locked down. <laughs> and yeah. basically, 
Yeah, the way we'll, we'll deal with is that they hold it and they're going to make you, you know, you being the U.S. government, they're going to make the U.S. government prove who that money belongs to before they release it. So nobody mm-hmm. can touch it. It's just being held by that country. Um, yeah, and they're probably benefiting from the, the interest or whatnot that, that's available to them. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's not – yeah, you can't ever run away from it. It's not yours forever. You won't be able to keep it, of course, whether you're that fraudulent transferee. Um, but it's it can create some headaches, a lot of headaches for folks who are innocent parties, definitely. Yeah, yeah. but it just goes to, sh- it goes to show you, though, that when we're talking about this, you might think, wow, this is so overwhelming, you know, because everybody, like, pushes for freedom. You know, they want this idea that yeah, they can just yeah. be free. But well, we're really not when it comes to this, but yet, yeah. you know, you just need to, to to protect yourself as best you can. There's all these ways you can protect yourself. If you live, you know, keep your nose clean, yep. live right, then you won't have to worry about it. But th- yeah, there's yeah. ways to, to, and to do the greater it. freedom. Yeah. Yeah. The greater freedom, the greater the cost. Right. So, That's right. Uh, you know, a trust you're giving up, generally you're going to give up some control and some of that freedom mm-hmm. for the benefits of either taxation or wealth um, transferring and this and that. But you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay to, to form it. You're going to pay for the ongoing costs um, to, to be able to have that that assurance that it's mm. going to be transferred the right way, or that you're going to minimize certain tax obligations. So, um, yeah, no, it's a, that's what's fun about it. And, and it, you know, what we talked about in our first podcast from the beginning was we, we had to sit down and go over the goals. Um, and I know we're hitting so such stuff such so generally, and I hope that it's it's interesting to your listeners, but. Really, if anyone is interested in this, it's going to start with, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to happen? And then my role and other, you know, other attorneys or CPAs role is to figure out, okay, this is what you want to happen. What are the best vehicles to assure that happens and to make that happen for you? Um, And it's a fun, there's so many different ways to customize these things and ways to put it together that, you know, no two estate plans are alike. And yeah, it's, be, right? it really is. It really is fascinating when you think about it, how many ways you can wrap it up to where it works right for you. And you just need to talk about it. And a lot of people put off talking about a state plan. Like, I don't want anything to happen to me. You know, like if they say something, something's yeah. going to happen. No, I can guarantee you the people that things happen to are the people who never do this. Yeah. The people who yeah. go and do this, they, they, they're, they're okay. <laughs> so go yeah. ahead and do it. There's you a lot of thought and, and, you know, consideration into putting any of these together. And that's what, that's where all the professionals roles come mm-hmm. in is that they're the experts. They uh, help facilitate that so that they minimize risks. They minimize question marks and make, and in some cases help eliminate that, you know, what's going to happen, you know um, what to expect with, with your, your estate plan. So, yeah. well, definitely. That's great. Well, Rocky, you've been just great. Brian, do you have any more questions for him? Oh, I, I could go on forever, but uh, <laughs> we don't want to go on. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, we're going to wrap up our, our second time having Rocky Rydell yeah. on of the Rydell Law Firm. And as always, we'll have all the links, all the information. We're even going to have a printout of all the questions and things that you can ask if you're interested in this and uh, ways for you to contact uh, Rocky. And now I'm going to hand it off to Tammy. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. And thank you again, Rocky. And uh, thank you, Jennifer and Brian, for hosting today. Uh, again, action, our information packed episode. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, like Jennifer said, we'll have everything in the show notes. We'll have how you can contact and reach out to Rocky in the show notes. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments or shout outs, please email me at Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y, at Leafy Legal Services, and I will get back to you right away and uh, make sure I send you in the right direction. So uh, thank you, everyone, again, and have a wonderful day, a great week, and we'll see you next time. Attention real estate investors and entrepreneurs. Did you know that real estate investors are a primary target for lawsuits? According to the National Survey of the Court data, 25% of Americans risk being sued in their lifetime. However, if you are a real estate investor, you have a 95% chance of being sued in the next 20 years. Leafy Legal Services helps you protect your assets and strategically grow your business and wealth. Leafy Legal Services are experts at the Series LLC and Delaware Statutory 
Trust, two of the newest and most ideal legal structures for real estate investors. Leafy Legal Services have the most personalized and affordable solutions for setting up LLCs. Property owners are always at risk when it comes to their assets. Anonymity is so important. If you own just a rental house and you own your home, you have to protect yourself and your properties from any potential legal issues. Leafy Legal Services have the right solutions to make sure you are happy and feel secure. They offer cost-effective documentation that suits their clients' needs. For a free consultation and ebook, visit leafylegalservices.com. They are waiting to hear from you. Leafylegalservices.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't wait. Take action now. LeafyLegalServices.com. Protect your assets, grow your business, and manage your wealth.